Let's do this. Yeah. So we we gotta get you out of here and. Well, we, when do you need out? Like by 11:15? Yeah, 11:15. Welcome to the Servecast, Mobile Serve's Canadian tech-focused podcast. I'm Patrick O'Rourke, and Brad Bennett, a man who just can't stop referring to himself as the bad boy of tech, is once again across the internet for me at an undisclosed location. It's not that undisclosed, it's like that same yellow office room that you have. You're also not wearing a leather jacket this week. Well, it's summertime, it's hot. I have a leather undershirt on, um, and I like to think of this as gold, not yellow, but you know, it's what we dream of. It's uh, Does Apple have a special name for like... The gold iMac? No, it's just it's, it's just, just gold. Yellow, right? No, it's yellow. Yeah, you're right. It's yellow. Yellow, just yellow. Okay. I was I was thinking that we should refer to your your room as that color, but if it's just yellow, that's, that's not exciting. But I think marigold. Uh, what do you think about that? Mar- anyway. <laughs> this but week yeah. we also have John Lamont, Lamont, our resident Windows PC guy. He's on the podcast and he's here to talk about Apple stuff. So like, I kind of imagine that this is like a certain level of torture for him, but but he's here. How are you doing, John? It's like double agent um, espionage. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, it's like a small torture, but not not the worst torture. Um, I always find the Apple events interesting because they announce a bunch of stuff and half of it is like, oh, that's actually kind of neat. And half of it is, wow, that's something that's like been available for multiple years on other platforms. It's great. It's a great balance. Welcome to the walled garden. It's lovely in here. Yeah. You can't do anything, but uh, you might not get a virus or something. It feels so safe <laughs> and expensive. Yeah, it feels so safe and expensive. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it, the expensive wall garden. So yeah, as, as you probably, probably already guessed on this week's episode, we're only talking about WWDC. We just watched the keynote yesterday. It's fresh in, of all, fresh in all of our minds. Uh, we're going to be talking about iOS 15, iPad OS 15, Mac OS 15, Watch OS 8, and a few other like neat surprises from the event. We have a ton of stuff to go over and like a pretty hard out on this this episode. So we're going to move through it like somewhat quickly, I think. Uh, but before we get to that, Bennett, hit us with the hottest news of the week. Yeah, so um, the, just, I'll just brush through it really quickly today so we can get through it. But first off, if you have a Chromecast with Google TV and you're a Stadia player, they did it, guys. They finally brought Stadia to Chromecast with Google TV, which is the new Chromecast with the remote. It took eight months. It's coming, I think, June 23rd. It's also coming to a bunch of Android TVs. So eight months after they announced the Chromecast, I, over a year since Stadia came out, and it's finally available on Android TVs and all the Chromecast devices. Good on you, Google. You just really good, good job. Uh, moving on. Not a good job, guys. It's a joke. It's moving on. It's a little late. It's so, so late. late. Like, them. how did they? Sorry, I need to stand. I'm leaning too far forward. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, how did they? Like, it makes me so aggravated that they, they launched the Chromecast and didn't have Stadia. They it's just Android TV. It never come to Android TV. It's like, how do you expect to grow this platform if you're going to make everyone buy a Chromecast Ultra to play it, which is like a ninety dollar thing in Canada? It's ridiculous. Anyway, it's, moving on. It, it make. I, I just want you go, go, to go, say yeah. one thing. It makes me sad because like. I know a lot of people are really hard on Stadia, but I think the underlying technology powering Stadia, like the actual streaming, is better than anything else out there. Like it's more I think so too. Um, I find that it's way more reliable than XCloud. It performs on slower connections. I think there's a place for Stadia. Like I know there's a lot of people that hate it. Like Brad Shankar like hates Stadia with a passion. Um yeah. and I get it. I get it, but I also think there's an audience out there for it. And it's just disappointing that Google has like drop the ball in so many instances on the platform yeah it's it is it's super sad because like yeah that the remote that or the controller that connects right to the wi-fi i think makes a huge difference and it is just like amazing when you can just go off from your like office to your tv and just keep playing your game it feels great but anyway it's sick hopefully google will figure it out hopefully google won't kill it take it up pack pasture with the uh, allo and google play music and all those guys but we'll see Anyway, moving on, uh, Hyundai Onyx pre-orders have started. That's Hyundai's cool-looking uh, electric car. Since we're breezing through this, we won't talk about it too much, but I know you're a big fan of it, Pat. I am too. I'm hoping that you or probably you will get one to review maybe if we're lucky, and then we can yeah. go hands-on with it and write a lot about it because it seems like a cool uh, EV, more of a mass-market regular person one, which I, I like, need don't of. care. I don't care about cars. Like it's not Cars aren't my thing. He um, hates them. He goes outside yeah, all them. the time. Just... He's like, I wish there weren't any cars. I'm like, I, I hate cars as much as Brad Shankar hates Stadia. Wow. It's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of No, because yeah. like, I, it's just not my thing, right? Like, I've never been into them. But this 
this um, car, like everything from the design to the like distance that you can drive it based on the battery. Like there's so many things in it that, that appeal to me. So I'm working with Hyundai to like figure something out later in the summer. So hopefully we'll have something, something on the site. Yeah. Even a test drive would be just helpful. I think to write about it because EVs are so it's a hard like market to jump into if you want to buy one. So I think the more hands on time we can do to write about it, give people impressions will be, be helpful. Um, moving on, Android working to hide uh, user ID, user advertising IDs, kind of like Apple. Although John, you wrote this when I was reading it last night, and it's not, it doesn't seem as good as app tracking transparency. Yeah, it's it's definitely not as good as what Apple's doing. Um, the main issue there being that it's not opt out by default. So with Apple's version, it's turned off, and you have to go into the settings and and turn it on if you want apps to access your advertising ID. Whereas on Android, it's turned on by default and you have to go hunt through the settings menu to find the option to turn it off. Mm. Um, the other thing is, is how Android works right now is you have an advertising ID and you can opt out of personalized ads, um, but your advertising ID is still visible. So really all that's changing is when you opt out of personalized ads, your advertising ID will no longer be visible. Um, but everything else kind of works the same way. And then Google is going to add a different tracking id specifically for analytics and like fraud detection and stuff like that so that companies don't have to use the advertising id for that um so it's a little bit more complicated um but it's ultimately a good thing and it's going to roll out slowly so it's starting with android 12 and then it's going to come to older devices sometime in 2022 i believe so without getting too much into it seems like a step in the right direction but maybe not as as much of a step as we'd hope basically yeah. okay great great summary Thanks. I, I basically took that from what you said. But um, so Apple is making AirTag app for Android apparently to make that less of a walled garden experience. So what people on Android can use AirTags or they just like can scan AirTags? No, uh, the app is off? a detection feature. So um, one of the big concerns with AirTags oh, is that- a, You can't be tracked with an AirTag. Yeah, you can use them to stalk people. Sense. You put an AirTag, you sneak an AirTag into somebody's bag or something, and then you can follow them around. And iOS has a built-in feature that will, your iPhone will warn you if there's an AirTag that you don't own that's hanging around you, right? Yeah. But there's no such thing for Android. So basically, it sounds like Apple's going to put out a detection app for Android that will warn you if an an air tag that you don't own is following you around. That's pretty which cool. Which is good on one in one sense because, you know, you don't want people stalking you, but at the same time I don't really want to have an Apple app on my Android phone that the only purpose is to tell me if there's an air tag near me that That's I don't true. own. That is a bit like dystopian scary. You're like, yeah, I have this app. It's like, oh, what's that app for? It's like, oh, I just so to make sure I'm not being stalked by all these like tech products that are out in the world now because that's where we live. And everyone's like, whoa, great, cool, fun one. Is that 99 cents or do you, do you get that for free on the app store? Um, yeah. But yeah, no, that's, I guess, smart on Apple. I mean, they were getting some criticism for that. So I guess good that they did it. Yeah. Um, and then the last one is the CRTC seems to be working on a three digit suicide hotline. So I guess three digit, kind of like 911, but it would be, you know, for suicide prevention. Seems pretty cool. Um, yeah, I was reading through that story last night. So, sounds interesting. Uh, to my biggest surprise is like, What's holding them back from doing this exactly? There was nothing much in this in the story, but it's like, just put it out there. It seems like a helpful way that people can get help, and especially now in like when everyone's locked inside. Although maybe that's ending. Uh, I would imagine the there's some stuff. regulatory back end to that, like to to have you know a three digit like nine one one. There's a lot of um, work that goes on behind the scenes with that. And I wrote a story earlier about. Um, a place I want to say in Alberta or BC that only just got 911 recently. And before there was like a full 10 digit number they had to call to get emergency services because they just didn't have the um, infrastructure out there for 911 support. So I would imagine that's okay. probably why it's taking a long time, but um, it, it would be a good thing to have. Interesting. I thought it would just like redirect to an established, you know, call center, what that we have for like mental health things but that makes sense too um but hopefully they iron it out it happens and it helps save lives um kind of a downer ending of the hot news but that's it that's the end of the hot news let's talk about apple stuff and, and try to be happy again Woo! yeah so uh, the first thing i think we'll just delve into is ios 15 
I thought it generally was like a pretty boring update to Apple's mobile operating system. Last year was huge. There's a lot of new stuff. So this is pretty much what I expected, like minor new features, stuff that kind of like changes the OS to better suit the like work from home world we live in. So there's new FaceTime features, like a portrait view, web-based Android slash PC compatibility with uh, FaceTime invites, which is I didn't expect that. I didn't think that that was something Apple was ever going to do. So it's a, a little bit of an example of like the wall garden approach being pulled down, whether that's because of like antitrust stuff or just like something that makes sense for them to have now that we all work from home. My bet is Who that knows? maybe FaceTime is going to get like a paid component. So having the more people into it, the better. That was sort of where it I might. was leaning towards that. That's yeah. a good point. I don't know. Uh, how, there's also but... there's also new messages features. Um, there's there's like a bunch of stuff and, and there's notifications like with the new focus feature and stuff like that. Uh, I, I guess just to like kick this off, I'll, I'll throw this to both of you. What what did you feel was like the biggest update, like the most significant, most interesting thing that Apple's bringing to the table with iOS 15? Um, yeah, like you said, kind of boring. There was a lot to unpack. I mean, once we started writing about it, there's like more things than you could think of. But I think for me, it was either the improvements to Apple Wallet, the fact that you can get like home keys in there. So like you could use an Apple Watch or just your phone to like unlock your front door really easily uh, without having to like dive into your phone, unlock it, open an app, get to the key. That just streamlined things. I mean, car keys are already coming. Plus, they also um, showed in the states they're working to get digital IDs in there as well. So that's a huge, a huge thing for me. I like, I've been dreaming about only having to carry my phone as my only like wallet device since I was, I don't know, in high school. So as the closer we get to that reality, the better. And uh, the one thing, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but the one thing I would say about that is I have absolutely like. I really don't think that's ever going to come to Canada. And if it does, it will be like five years from now. That, that's yeah. that's I, my guess. I think I, I'm putting my money on two years from now. So, and this is why, you know, that like, uh, what's it called? Digital ID me app or whatever. That's kind of like going around. We've written about it a few yep. times as it gets approved in EID, more and more provinces. Yeah. EID. Um, I'm thinking once that gets like regulatory approval everywhere and becomes more standardized, perhaps then it'll be easy to just sure. integrate that into Fair the Apple yeah, Wallet. That's, that's where yeah. my theory is coming from. And then the other thing that I kind of liked was uh, notification management. Basically, Apple had set these, they're called like Focus, which is just a very short name that doesn't really describe what they do at all. But they're basically like less intense versions of Do Not Disturb. So if you're at work, you put on like your work focus and then, you know, you'll get emails from work and you'll get your Slack messages to come through. But maybe you won't be getting all those random notifications from Reddit or, you know, Amazon being like, buy this, buy this, buy, you know, you'll be getting just ideally in the perfect scenario, you'll be getting just um, the notifications that relate to work and then you can have one for after work and just, you know, then you won't be getting the Slack messages or the work emails. You'll be getting those random things from Reddit or those entertainment app notifications. And, um, and then after that, like when that is done, the notifications that it blocked, it will give you in like a kind of a cool summary. So it should help your notification screen from not being just an endless list of things to scroll through where you're, no one is looking at it. You're like, there's a hundred things here. I'm just going to clear them all and hope I didn't miss anything important. So I hope that helps and it applies off your phone to the Mac, to the Apple watch, uh, iPad. It's all like synced together. I thought that was pretty cool. And but, that's yeah. something that like, I, I mean, like John, I think in the notes, I can see like, this is what you're going to talk about. But like, I thought that the, the new notification management stuff, like I agree with you. I didn't think it took things far enough. Like iOS notifications suck. It's one of my least favorite things about the operating system. Um, awful. How was it a letdown to you? Like, what did you want to see Apple do with that system? What did you want it to be more like Android like, where you can actually break down the the management to a, to a lower level? A, a little bit. Um, yeah, just kind of opposite to Bennett. I thought that the notification management was not nearly enough for the situation that Apple has, and um, I have like a love hate relationship with notifications on iOS. Um, I find that notifications come through much more reliably on my iPhone than on Android. Like if somebody sends me an email, I get the Gmail yeah, notification totally. on my Android phone or sorry, on my iPhone, sometimes up to four minutes before it shows up on my Android phone. Like Definitely. it's pretty ridiculous, the disparity, but at the same time, the iPhone, the way that it displays notifications is it's, it's like a fire hose. It just shows everything and you end up with this huge list unless you're constantly staying on top of it and it can be really overwhelming. 
Whereas how Android segments things into conversations, important, and then like not important, I find is a lot better for organization because I can really quickly access, you know, important messages, text messages, conversations, you know, instant messages and stuff like that right up at the top of my notifications. That's happening too in iOS. Like they Is it? Yeah, they didn't really put a big deal on it, but like I'm pretty sure that they had said that like conversations will like filter to the top. Okay. That's, that's a really big change. And if, if that's the case, like that definitely improves iOS notifications in a huge way. Um, but yeah, it's, it, for me, it was really disappointing to see what they did and just like have the focus mode and stuff like that. Yeah. We'll have to see how well it works and if it's like implemented well, I know even on Android, like I think Facebook messenger and Android messages work well in that like conversation system, but I don't think my discord messages like come up into there yet, which is kind of annoying. Um, and still, I mean, it's like the chat bubbles thing is still kind of an issue, but there's, um, that, that like daily recap too, that like combines all of your notifications into one like thing at the end of the day that, that, yeah, the summary, is that what it's called? Summary. I I would try that. Like I, I installed all the dev betas. I I have it on, um, purple iPhone 12 mini. I just haven't had time to play around with it yet. So that's yeah. one of the things I'm excited to, to get a better handle on. Um, before we move on to iPad OS, the other big thing that I thought at least, and, and I know that this isn't just an iOS feature, it works with some of the other op- new operating systems too, is SharePlay. To me, that seemed like a very pandemic era feature. It mm-hmm. seems really cool. Um, you can do all kinds of stuff with it, like watch an Apple TV Plus show, with like a friend, it's like there's screen sharing, there's app sharing, there's all kinds of interesting things. I guess I'm just interested in like, what what did you guys think about it? Did it just seem like Apple once again, copying like features that already exist or copying things from apps that are already available on Android or the app store? Or do you think this is like an original new compelling thing that is like a better spin on that concept? It definitely is a better spin, unfortunately, because it's like it, it appears to be so streamlined. Um, it depends on how many things. I mean, Netflix ha- doesn't support it yet. It seems like it's just Disney Plus, Hulu, and Apple Disney TV Plus. Plus. Yeah. They do have a, an API. Like, it, there's a development API to support it, but like, uh, yeah, it's still history it's shows that like that doesn't mean a lot, right? At least at launch, like, um, developers might not adapt to it. It may be too hard to use. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, yeah. Personally, I, the I know lots of people use that like Netflix, like couch sharing or whatever. So you can like watch things together. It's like a Chrome extension maybe, or maybe they added it back naturally. But I know people that really enjoy that. I've never used it, but I do in my discord chat with my friends, we have a, an add on or like an app in it called rhythm. And so anytime you share like a YouTube link, you can get it to play for everybody at the same time. So you can all listen to songs together and we use that a lot. So Taking that and adding it to FaceTime seems cool. Um, oh, I think you can sh- stream, sh- share, play TikToks. And I, I'm imagining for like a teen audience, like if you were, if I was like in high school and I'm assuming if I was in high school, I'd be using TikTok more. That's just an assumption. But I'm assuming I'd be like calling my friends every night, talking to them because we're all locked at home right now. And we could just like watch TikToks and laugh together. I think that seems like a pretty fun thing. Um, how much it actually gets used. I'm not sure. I don't know. John, what do you... Yeah, I think you know? I think SharePlay is kind of classic Apple where they take a feature that's kind of well that's established on other it. platforms and then do it, but do it in the Apple way where it's a little bit better and a little bit unique. Um, but I also think there's an element of Apple playing catch up with FaceTime and taking FaceTime to feature parity with some of the other platforms out there like Google Meet or Duo and, and WhatsApp. Um and I think that's also part of why we saw the Android browser compatibility come out. Um, and it's not so much Apple lowering the walled garden as it is giving Android users a very small, crappy window into the walled garden to say, hey, this is what it could be like on our side, but you're stuck over there in your web browser. Yeah. Are you referencing iTunes on, on Windows and how bad that has been and continues to be for the last, like I don't know, 15 years or whatever it is? Uh, no, um, at I least iTunes but, on Windows uh, was a native app, you know, <laughs> so yeah, bad I, though. Have you ever used it? It's like one yeah, of the man, worst of app, like programs I've ever used in my life. Like, cause I, I had an iPod, like when I, when I was yeah. younger, obviously I still mm-hmm. don't use an iPod now. I'm not that old, 
but like I had an iPod and I used it with a Windows laptop because I was a Windows user until like 2012. And that thing crashed all the time. And that's like a perfect example of what John's talking about. Where like, sure, you can have it. This program is here, but it runs like garbage. You should just get a Mac because it'll be better. Like that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So yeah, like I, I get what you're saying, John. So I, yeah. I, yeah, I'm on the same page too. I'm worried that like adding or not adding, joining a FaceTime call from a browser, I think will be a subpar experience than using it natively. And I'm, I hope it works well. And like kids and people can just, you know, chat with their friends without having to worry about like being excluded from being on a different operating system and stuff. Cause that hurts. But I, I, I think how it's, well it work is a whole different thing. It's one more level. So I, I think we've talked about it on the podcast before, but iMessage creates this kind of in-group out-group scenario where it's like, you know, somebody might create a group message with all their friends, but if you have an Android message or an Android phone, you're now the green bubble guy and you don't get the same conversation features yeah. and you might get kind of excluded from that, that group chat. Right. So I feel like this is almost the same thing where, yeah, Android phones can now be in the FaceTime call, but all the people in the FaceTime call are going to be like, you know, putting their Memoji filters on and like doing all the, and doing share play and stuff like that. And I doubt those extra features are going to be supported in the web browser. So you'll be there, but you're going to be excluded from all the cool stuff, which yeah, probably might compel some people to just say, screw it. I'm going to get an iPhone so I can do all this cool FaceTime stuff. The other you thing know, I was going to say about share play is I think for me, it's not a feature that I would use very much. But uh, going back to the TikTok example, TikTok clearly shows that like sharing features are like a really, really great growth hack, basically. Like if you look at TikTok's duet feature, that's like one of the staple features for sharing and spreading content on the platform. So I think like looking at what Apple's doing with SharePlay and, and FaceTime, those sharing features, some people are going to use them like crazy and it's really, really going to become a staple feature. But for a lot of people like me, I'm kind of like, nah, it doesn't do anything for me. When I think the, that's a fair look at it. Just before we get Go off ahead. FaceTime, how weird is it that they brought spatial audio to FaceTime? Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I was thinking so about like, that last night. We're having a video chat. We're all looking at our screens. Does it mean like if I just turn this way, I'm only going to yeah, hear sound like, like out of this there. ear? But like, yeah. what? This the seems like cast now with spatial audio. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're throwing spatial audio into everything right now, which is cool. But they're also implementing it in different ways. Like spatial audio in Apple Music is different than spatial audio in FaceTime or when you're watching content on a TV. And I wish they just would have branded them in two different ways. Anyway, that's okay, the last little thing I had to say. Let's shift to iPad OS. I thought this was like a very underwhelming update, but it was also 100% what I expected. Like, so the, for me, I wanted widgets off the home screen. They gave me that. Thank you. They revamped um, multitasking to make it like a little easier to understand. <laughs> I guess this is a little embarrassing to admit, but like the only multitasking I do on the iPad is like split screen. That's it. The other I form of multitasking, I often forget how it works. And every single time I review an iPad and I have to take pictures of the other forms of multitasking, I have to Google it because I forget yeah. how it works. And like, I don't think I'm alone in that. And it's a little sad because I'm the managing editor of a tech website. But like, I think a lot of people run into that same issue. Um, but anyways, Bennett, is there anything else included in iPad OS 15 that's like notable and that we should we should care about? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, so the thing I like the most, and this is like a me specific thing, but I think a lot of people will enjoy it, is the, the quick note thing. So basically, I think you can just swipe up from the bottom corner. You might need to just swipe up with an Apple Pencil. I don't think we've gotten clarification from Apple back on that one yet. But basically, you can pull up a note, a tiny notepad uh, everywhere all the time and you can do it's it on sick. mac os 2 apparently which seems sick because like removing steps into the notes app means you're more likely to take notes and i mean who am i kidding when you take notes you remember things better it's just like that's what notes are have always been so the easier you can access notes the better like when i use the lg dual screen phone my second screen was just always a notepad and i was like this is sick because now this phone is like a notepad that is just always there always ready to go it's awesome. Like on my computer right now in front of me, I have Google Keep pinned to my taskbar so I can open the notepad as quick as possible and just like start taking notes. So the removing steps from the notepad, very excited about that. I think that's cool. All the other notes stuff like, oh, you can tag people in notes and collaborate in notes. I don't know how many people are using notes for like large form collaborative projects. Good on you. Um, 
universal control. I don't know. Do we want to jump into that or save that for the, the Mac OS thing? Mm, we, we can talk about it now and, and just like explain how that applies to, to, to Mac OS, I guess. Basically, I think that's the other cool thing. If you've used a Mac and an iPad before, you've learned that you can now use your iPad through a technology called Sidecar, which I'm assuming is just an AirPlay impl implementation of some kind that that's allows is, you yeah. to stream your, you know, use your iPad as a second display for your Mac. They've sort of taken that a bit further where you're not using it as a second display, but you're actually accessing the iPad and using it as an iPad at the same time with the same mouse and keyboard that you're using from your Mac. So if you put it beside it now, you can just, I mean, I'm going to like, I'm going to describe what I saw Apple do. Magic. I don't think that it is going to work this well for most people. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to describe what we saw. But basically they put the iPad down, takes the mouse, scrolls it over and it just goes onto the iPad. Then you can pick up a file on the iPad, drag it back to the Mac, drop it and use it on the Mac. So I'm assuming it's an airplay slash airdrop situation that's working very seamlessly i don't know how he was able to transfer those files that fast unless they like pre-stage those jpegs is like ultra compressed or something but yeah you can just basically put a mac and an ipad beside each other or even two macs and just start like dragging files between them and using the mouse on the main mac that you're using and the keyboard on the ipad or the other mac and it all just works together I guess. I don't know. It seems crazy. It seems like witchcraft, but it, it seems it awesome. definitely does. And like, when I think about it, I was trying to think of, you know, what hardware was, you know, playing into that and enabling that feature. And I thought, you know, maybe it's something to do with the M1 chip, but not every iPad has the M1, right? So, and then I was thinking, okay, well, maybe it's got something to do with, you know, ultra wideband, but Macs don't have ultra wideband chips. So like, I have no idea what hardware goes into that to make it so seamless, but like it is so impressive. What, and if it, if it works even close to that good, it'll be super impressive. Yeah. So one, I don't think it's going to work as good as they showed in that demo. There's no way sidecar doesn't even like, it's not even as seamless as Apple made it out to be and it. It can be pretty glitchy at times. Um, and I have guess you, two, and you've done sidecar on an iPad pro cause I only have a base yeah. level iPad and I yeah, use it. Yeah. And I'm always like, maybe it's just my iPad, but you can, it does work. It works better on the iPad Pro, but it's also okay. like a little glitchy. Nothing to do with the M1. To my understanding, um, at least what I was told, is that the technology relates to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And it has nothing to do with the M1. And that's no expansion on that statement. So maybe we'll learn more about it later. But like, I truly don't think it's going to work as advertised. I think maybe it will eventually, but at least the first implementation of um, universal control, it's not going to like live up to expectations. That that's my my guess. It just um, seems so cool. It's I'm going to steal a point from my Mac OS piece. I it seems really cool at first, but the more you think about it, or at least for me, the more I think about universal control, I'm just like, it's really silly. Like why? Mm -hmm. I just, I struggle to think of any great scenario where I'm like, I've got my Mac OS, my Mac here, you know, I'm typing, I'm, I'm working on something and I now want to go and use iPad OS with my Mac. Like so it, I, it just seems, I can think of like a couple, you yeah. know, use cases where it would work, but generally I'm just like, it just seems really silly. I feel you. I think because I have... Like I'm the Apple guy at the site. I have like a bajillion iPads. And He's a bunch an Apple of tattoo that's the size of Steve Jobs' head on his back. I've seen it. <laughs> That'd be great. That, that I'm that I'm like so. I have all these devices, and there are instances where like I'll start working on a feature on my Mac, and then like maybe I want to go into my backyard, and I don't want to take my my MacBook Pro with me, and I want to like transfer that to the iPad. Like there's instances that I could see that happen, but like I'm a special use case. The average person isn't going to do that, right? Like a lot of people mm -hmm. that are buying an iPad Pro not a lot but like i have anecdotally at least heard of people using that as their main device right like they don't have a mac anymore that is their main computing device is an ipad pro because it's expensive it's pricey you get all the accessories it costs a fortune mm -hmm. i i i think this is like I, I get what you're saying john i guess in a roundabout way i'm agreeing with you i i don't see the average like apple user being really being able to take advantage of this in the way that apple presented it yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm on that page too. It's tough because like AirDrop will just do the same thing and everyone already knows how to use it and where to use it. And, you know, like it's not like Apple's going to be training people like, oh, you know, try out uh, 
what's this called again? Universal control. universal universal control. But it's like people don't people won't even know that that exists. So yeah. like, are they going to use it? Probably not. Uh, and then like an alt alternative to that i i can see like you know an older person who maybe isn't so tech savvy they're using their mac and they've got their ipad on the table next to them and they accidentally go into universal control mode and it's just like oh no it's over for them they they have no idea they're like i'm using my mac and things are happening on my ipad i don't know what's going on anymore that's like was stressing me out during this update too because like so many new things were like added in small tweaks like all the new ways to multitask which like for someone like us who like you know, gets these things, researches them, gets excited about them. It's cool. But like I was visiting, I was on vacation last week and I visited my grandma and her iPad just got updated to whatever iPad, iPad OS 14 or whatever, I guess. Um, and the photos app changed and the email app changed. And she was having a very hard time yeah. like using those. Like she couldn't understand it. She's like, I lost all my photos. Like I just want to show you my, these pictures of your cousin's kids, blah, 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 you know, grandma stuff. And then she's like, okay, I got to go in this email. I've actually put it in the trash. I know it's in the trash. I don't know how to get it out anymore, but like we can still look at it. It's here. And like, yeah, like you said, for it's tough because iPads are like the main, in my experience, are like the main computers of like elderly people um, and making them more productive for people who are working like us. Cool. But if we're not actually the main market, are you like, pulling it away from the market that it's servicing now, like kids and, and elderly people who don't know technology well, or don't have the time or the want to learn all these like, you know, specific multitasking features put in the, you know, do this little gesture. I mean, this is kind of the reason that windows eight failed, right? It was all these like gestures or what were they called charms. And everyone was like, I, I don't know what this is. I don't want to use it like this. I, I know how to use it this way, this old way. Can we just please stay that way? And they, they went back, but yeah, I don't know if that kind of relates to what you're saying, but I was something I experienced recently. Yeah, for sure. Speaking mm-hmm. of subtle changes, John, do you want to like quickly outline what's new in Mac OS Monterey, which is as far as I could tell next to nothing. There's a sick background. I got a really nice yeah. purple background now. On, sick on my background. Laptop. That's, that's like number one biggest change here. Just absolutely beautiful Hell yeah. wallpaper. Um, all right, all right let's, let's speed run quick. this. Oh yeah, yeah, go, go, go. Are there other new dynamic wallpapers, Pat? I don't know. I'll, I, well, John's answering this. I'm going to roll back okay. and I'm going to check. <laughs> okay, cool. Do it. I, I don't know about the dynamic wallpapers. I just know that new purple one. Yeah, Sick. the purple one does look cool. It's like a very... All right. So the big changes outside of universal control, because we've already talked about that, uh, is first, I'd say feature parity with iOS for things like notifications and the focus mode, share play etc. You can use your Mac as an AirPlay speaker now, which I guess is cool if your Mac has good speakers, but Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's like how you you use, um, you can use Spotify connect to like play something on your phone and then play it on your computer or whatever. So I guess you can do the same thing. There are some new ones. Sick. I love the dynamic wallpapers. I've been trying to make one myself, but this website I've been using keeps like crashing. So I, I don't know how I'm going to do it. It's the worst. Yeah. All right. Uh, what else is new in Mac OS, uh, Monterey? Great name, by the way. I like Monterey. Kind of a I hate name. it. It's I can't spell really? it. I've spelt it wrong That's like true. five times already. Too. That, that is true. Yeah, I've misspelt it a lot. Um, I had a hard time with Catalina anyway, so that's high Sierra things for me. Yeah. <laughs> best. B- Big Sur was the Big best. Big Sur was the best, opinion. you're right. Just such an odd name. Anyway, um, the Shortcuts. The Shortcuts app is coming to Mac OS, which is cool. Unless Very you're cool. really into using automator or whatever that other automations app was called that was on mac os but i think, you got I, think it right. yeah. I think that's still sticking around for a little while and you can port your automations from automator over to shortcuts um not really that big of a thing but there's nothing really that big in mac os monterey i think um, shortcuts are big on mac i don't use them very much on my phone because i don't use it for work i don't use it for productivity I but the fact that i can now like set up like three shortcuts to like open all the windows i need open in the morning and i can you can set up shortcuts to like convert images really quickly and like all these other kinds of cool things i think the productivity shortcuts i will use a lot more on mac than i do on my phone because like true. i true. tried to use them on my phone once before but it was like it ended up being slower to like transfer this image from my Mac to my phone, tr- convert it in the shortcut, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, but I think on Mac, I think it's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool thing. Was, I should have written about it in the, in the roundup, actually. I'm more excited about it than I than I was yeah. thinking about yesterday. The, the last thing I would say is the Safari changes are pretty significant. Um, 
it looks really nice, but I'm not yeah. sure kind of going back to what we talked about before with things changing and then people not knowing how to use it. I feel like moving the tab bar all into one thing and then turning the tab itself into your, your search bar is going to mess with a lot of people. And it's going to mess with a lot of people's muscle memory because your search bar is now going to move around the top of your Safari, depending on where your tabs are. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can see that potentially being a problem, but it looks really nice. It looks the, so good. The color sync with web pages, I think is really nice. There's a, couple other browsers i mentioned to uh, brad yesterday that vivaldi, vivaldi. Uh, which is a chromium based browser does that and it's it's a really nice touch i wish more browsers would do that because it would does it, it just looks nice does it go red on mobile syrup or is it, it so does it does yes. go red on mobile syrup i need to get on that that's sounds yeah. sweet I, lo I love in case you didn't know i love things that change colors yeah so and basically sense. what we're saying here is like this is a pretty pedestrian update that like Apple releases a new version of macOS every year. So they just had to release another version. Like I know there's certain things in there like share play and stuff we've already talked about, but generally yeah. speaking, like last year was the big change. It was the big visual mm -hmm. revamp that I'm assuming will be in line with the MacBook Pro, the new one, whenever that comes out, which we didn't see at uh, WWDC, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, because like I'd, I'd like a break, you know? I'd we like all want it, yeah. Bit. But um, I still want it. One the thing other really interesting oh. thing that I would say about Mac OS is considering it's such a small kind of not big deal update, there's a surprising number of Macs that aren't going to support it, even though they supported Big That's Sur, true. which was a huge update, right? Like um, I wrote it earlier and I don't remember what exactly it was, but like the a bunch of 2013 MacBooks and uh, iMacs are just not going to support it even though they got the big Sur update, which I thought was a really big surprise because there doesn't seem to be a lot different between Monterey and big Sur. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's interesting. Cause, and like a lot of the things that came to uh, Monterey are like you said, like bringing feature parity to the iPhone or iPad OS. So it mm -hmm. seems like those things shouldn't be drawing much more power really because they're essentially, uh, you know, shortcuts as an iPhone app, share playing works on your iPhone. So like, yeah, it's interesting to see how these things all work out. Um, one thing I was seeing a lot of memes about last night is iPad OS actually is getting supported quite a way back. Apparently, like the iPad Air 2 is still getting it, which is wild. That's cool. Uh, but I yeah, know we, that's a good point. I know we sort of got to wrap up because we have a hard out, but like, so there's Watch OS 8. Not a hell of a lot new. There's new like photo watch faces. That's kind of cool in a yeah, sense. Yeah, they use portrait data. Yeah. In a sense, I kind of get the idea that like, Apple is so far ahead of what Google's doing with Wear OS, at least right now, that like they don't need to innovate. They don't need to add new features. The watch is what it is. It's an established category now. It's a pretty mature operating system. It works. Like it has all these fitness features. I don't think there's anything else in there other than like the wallet stuff. There's like some new mindfulness features, but like similar to most of the other OS updates. Pretty, pretty, pretty pedestrian. Not that interesting, right, Bennett? Or was there something like uh, missing in there? Well, the mindfulness thing is just funny. John, do you have time to for this? It'll be quick. Yes. Sorry, Basically, I was on mute because I was opening my other meeting. The mindfulness thing. So, like the breathe. If you have an Apple Watch, it will be like it'll every once in a while be like, "Hey, take a deep breath for like thirty seconds. Just kind of like in, you know, relax." But the mindfulness one will be like the same thing, but it's like, "Hey." Think about something that really brought you joy in your life and then think about why. And it just like is like little things like that, which I think is hilarious because I don't know. I find myself skipping the breathe thing during the day because it's like, yo, I'm, I'm fine. I don't like I'm working. I don't have time. And then the mindfulness one is just like you're trying to interrupt me to like just have joyful memories. I yeah. don't know. Kind of nice, but also kind of like a little heavy handed on the relaxation uh, reflection type of mindset. I'm not sure. Kind of funny, I thought. We also know, didn't some people it. love that stuff. I True. I can't stand it. I'm I can't like, if I had an Apple Watch and it was telling me to stand up every twenty minutes, no. I'm I have it all turned it off. off for the most part. I do keep the stand up one on, but uh, yeah. The, <laughs> think of a, a summer breeze. Think of a childhood memory. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Remember also TV, TV OS 15, where like they barely even mentioned it. The only thing really is that spatial audio is finally coming to the Apple TV, which is a place where I think spatial audio makes sense. Um, we're also going to be able to use HomePod minis as speakers for the Apple TV, which I was How like many? cracking. Two, sorry, I think yeah. it's only could two. You, 
too. Oh, I was gonna say you line up like six or seven of them, maybe just really. No, get, like, I don't think so. Pumping sound. No, damn. I was cracking jokes about it on Twitter, and then like, um, I don't. I, someone needs. Somebody sent me a link to like a story where someone just raved about how great it is. So maybe it's something I need to try. I do have two HomePod Minis just sitting around that I don't really use, so I might. You'd I might give to... that a shot. You'd probably be able to get better stereo separation because you could place them very wide apart. Yeah. You know, like part of the reason the Sonos Arc soundbar was so good because it was so wide. The stereo separation was really nice. So I guess you could kind of get that with HomePod Minis, but you're going to lose that center channel unless it's still playing through the TV speakers. We'll have, yeah, we'll have to test it out, but it seems skeptical. Generally, like I, th- I thought that this was like it wasn't a boring WWDC. It was fine. It just wasn't as explosive as last year, and we didn't get the new MacBook Pro. Um, yeah. which I think was a letdown for a lot of people. But generally speaking, like it was okay. It was fine. It was the, the, the like expected updates. There wasn't really any surprises beyond like the, the FaceTime, like opening it up to the web and in the grand scheme of things, that, that's pretty minor. Yeah. It seems like it might be laying groundwork for a future, like very parody between iOS and Mac OS and iPad OS updates coming maybe next year or something. Cool. So yeah, we'll, we'll skip the, the games we're playing this week since, never changes for me anyways i'm just just playing apex you know so uh that's it thanks for listening to the syrup cast you can find me on twitter at, at patrick underscore work and of course on mobile syrup.com bennett where can people find you you can find me on twitter at bradfad and on mobile syrup.com you can find me on instagram there too but i don't post much but uh we did skip the game thing but i want to say but i haven't playing game i'm watching the bo burnham inside special on netflix oh, yeah, i probably yeah. watched it like eight times if you haven't watched it it is i don't know how to describe it it's really crazy broke me i think so destroyed you yeah and john where can people find you you can find me on twitter at john underscore lamont that's j-o-n underscore l-a-m-o-n-t and of course on the website mobilesyrup.com and as always you can find all of our content on mobilesyrup.com and also follow us on twitter and instagram at at mobilesyrup thanks for listening and watching uh-huh.